through both 240 Water Street and Governor's Island are here tonight. And I just want to thank them very much in advance for their time. Um, really extraordinary amount of effort and time being put into both these applications. And that's true for all of the public that's been really engaged on this, um, as was probably apparent in a nine, meet, nine hour meeting that the Landmark Preservation Commission um, just had. Um, so with an expectation of uh, no further insurrections today, uh, we'll ask that one, that all comments are respectfully and specifically made to address the draft scope of work for the environmental impact statement for 250 Water Street and the draft environmental impact statement for Governor's Island, and that all comments adhere to the board's two minute rule. Um, so I'm hopeful that we have Laura Dodge, who is our first presenter, who is the president of Excel Environmental Resources, Diana. I don't see she... Laura yet. Okay. Uh, so if you want to move on to the 250 water draft scope of work, someone from their team can just let me know who to establish as presenter. Thank you. That sounds good. So hi, 250. Somebody, I guess Mark. Hi, good, good evening, Alice. It's Adam Meister with Howard Hughes. Hi, Adam. Uh, we, we have a few people on our team that are part of the presentation. Uh, Charlie Fields from AKRF has the, um, the PowerPoint, I believe, and he'll be sharing it. Um, is he, has he been made a panelist? Can you repeat that name, Adam, please? Charlie Fields from AKRF. Uh, yep, yeah, I have Charlie. I will make him presenter. Okay. Yeah, we had some. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for your time. Um, two things. I'm just looking at my emails. Uh, Yasmin Kaluglu, who is from SOM, is requesting that she be admitted as a panelist. Uh, that's already done. I think, Charlie, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. And, um, are you doing the slideshow piece of it? Uh, I was hoping you are, but I can if you're unable to. It would be very helpful. I'm working off of uh, the iPad here. Okay, I don't have sharing rights at the moment. I'm moving. Uh, you should have it momentarily. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anna, Mark, thanks. Sure, Yasmin, uh, you should be able to, to go ahead and share your screen now. Perfect. Does this work? Yes. In, in terms of the order of speakers, um, David David Karnofsky is going to lead off um, and provide an overview on the um, the secret process and the draft scope of work, and then he'll turn it over to Charlie and other uh, other team members. Adam, could you just give me a sense of how long your presentation is? There's no problem. I just want to get a sense of timing. Uh, it's not, I, I think it's about uh, probably 20 minutes, okay. maybe less. It's not, it's not long. Great, fine. Thanks. So, David, are you are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, barely. Okay. But, yeah, we can uh, hear you, David. That's Welcome, better. David Karnowski. Nice to hear from you. Likewise. Uh, of course, I can't seem to see. Uh, my video is not working, so you may not see my face. Um, I'm disappointed. Yeah, I know you are. Um, <laughs> oh, good Here I am. Good evening, and thanks for inviting us today, uh, tonight, to discuss the task of a work at 250 Water Street. I'm David Karnofsky from the firm of Street Frank, uh, Land Use Counsel to Howard Hughes, and I'm joined tonight by Wesley O'Brien from the firm. Um, a few introductory remarks. As you know, the purpose of the draft scope of work is to identify the topics that should be addressed in the EIS. And for each area to be addressed, the scope of work identifies the study area, the types of data that will be gathered, and how these data will be analyzed. The purpose of the scoping process being to provide the public with an opportunity to comment regarding the topics that should be studied and how they should be studied in the EIS. The draft scope doesn't so much provide answers as much as it 
addresses the questions that should be asked and answered in the EIS. Uh, as you know, a scoping session was held in December, and a number of people, including members of this board, testified. Uh, as directed by city planning, the comment period remains open until next Monday, January 11th. After the public comment period ends, the scope of work will be revised by city planning as appropriate, uh, taking public comments into account. And a final scope of work will serve as the basis for the preparation of the EIS, and the results of all the analyses and investigations will be disclosed for public review in the EIS. The final scope will also include responses to comments made during the scoping process. I'm going to hand this over to Charlie Fields from AKRF, the environmental review consultant for the project, who will provide a brief overview of the secret process milestones that will be followed from here on in, as well as identify the, identify the various analysis topics included in the draft scope of work. We're not going to review each of these topics, but are happy to answer questions about how the scope proposes to address them. We do understand, however, that questions have been raised about how the Brownfields Cleanup Program and the EIS analysis of hazardous materials relate to each other. So Charlie and Mimi Rygorodetsky and Paul McMahon from Langen, Mark Shurtok from Saif Pagin and Rizal, and Michelle Demilly and Mark Benoit from Godot and Demilly will address this topic in some detail. We also received a request from the chair uh, to discuss flood resiliency and sustainability measures under consideration for 250 Water Street, and Yasmin Kologlu and Sol Hayutin from SOM will discuss this particular topic. But as I said, we're here to address uh, any questions you have relevant to the scope. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Charlie. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you to everybody for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, it is a, a crazy week uh, for everybody to be getting together, uh, but we appreciate your time. Um, Yasmin, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is, uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Charlie Fields of AKRF. We're the, we are the environmental consultants working with the Howard Hughes Corporation and the design team. Uh, along with the Department of City Planning and the preparation of the envir environmental review documents for the 250 Water Street project. Um, this is just a very general overline of uh, what we've done so far, where we're at in the process. Um, I know many of you are, are familiar with uh, ULERP and, and familiar with uh, how the EIS process works, but uh, the EAS and scope have been prepared and released, as David said, um, put out for public comment period, which uh, ends on Monday. A uh, scoping meeting was held. Um, thank you for your input to that. Um, and right now we are in the process of collecting comments we've received so far and um, whatever comes in in the next few days. Uh, and as David said, those will be considered and responded to um, in the final scope of work and in the content of the draft EIS. Um, so going forward, you know, we've started doing some of the background work, um, you know, sort of existing conditions. Um, we'll be turning over draft chapters and uh, a document to the Department of City Planning and relevant agencies for their review and consideration. Um, obviously when that is done, when they are satisfied that the work is complete and correct, um, the draft is certified and we go into the ULERP process. Um, so you guys have an opportunity now, obviously, to comment on the draft scope of work um, and then a comment on the DEIS and as a community board um, to make your recommendations. Um, next slide, please, Yasmin. In the uh, interest of keeping things short for tonight's presentation, I'm not going to go through all of the technical areas uh, that, that are in the draft scope of work. Um, I know many of you have looked at it. Um, it is on the Department of City Planning website. I know the community board, I think, has provided links or shared that document for everybody, too. So that's great. Um, we're doing a full EIS. So um, most of the uh, technical areas covered in the secret technical manual um, will be considered in the EIS from uh, land use, traffic, shadows, 
uh, construction, air quality. Um, so it'll be a, a robust set of analyses that we'll be looking uh, to incorporate into the uh, EIS. Uh, we'll also describe mitigation measures, alternatives to the proposed project, describe the proposed project itself, include summary chapters in the EIS um, as is normal. All the analyses will be using the guidance of the Seeker Technical Manual. Uh, Department of City Planning is the environmental review lead agency uh, to state uh, the obvious um, so we'll be working with them on all of this um, and uh, we look forward to your questions at the end of this uh, with whatever people um, would like to ask and discuss um, i'm now going to turn it over uh, to mimi to to talk a little bit about the brownfields cleanup program um, the timeline and process for that and um, and how that correlates to um, some of the stuff that will be incorporated into the EIS. Thank you, Thanks. Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. I'm Mimi Ray Gorodetsky, and I'm a principal at Langen Engineering, and we're also environmental consultants representing Howard Hughes, but not for the environmental planning piece for the Brownfield Cleanup Program. And I have shared this slide a couple of times before to uh, CB1. This is a um, flow chart from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's website that shows the steps involved in the Brownfield Cleanup Program. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it before, it really demonstrates that the BCP is a very robust cleanup program with many, many steps. It is overseen by both the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and also the New York State Department of Health. And um, the elements of this slideshow really up until this green line in the middle relate to site investigation. And then after the green line, they relate to site remediation and project closeout and completion. So where are we right now in the Brownfield cleanup program? Well, we're right here where this red box is in the upper central portion of the diagram. Uh, we have completed the environmental investigation as presented, or, I'm sorry, we have completed the remedial investigation as presented in the remedial action or remedial investigation work plan. And we are in the process of preparing the remedial investigation report. Um, after the remedial investigation report is uh, shared with DEC, actually concurrently with uh, sharing it with DEC, and even now we are initiating discussions regarding what the remedy might look like on this site. Next slide, please. Um, I understand that there are some questions about how the Brownfield cleanup program works relative to the environmental review process. And essentially, the processes are occurring concurrently, but they do dovetail in a couple of ways. First of all, the draft environmental impact statement and specifically the hazardous materials chapter within that draft environmental uh, impact statement will include available remedial investigation data. Second, the final environmental impact statement, and again, the hazardous material, materials chapter of that document will include elements of the remedy as they are known at the time that the FEIS is issued. Uh, both the DEIS and the FEIS will include hazardous materials mitigation measures that are protective of public health and the environment, both during and after construction. And we can move on to the next section of the program. Thank you. So the next topic we would like to briefly talk about, uh, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, perfect. Um, is the DFE design flood elevation uh, based on current zoning and the building height and the impact of any amendments that may occur in the near future? Um, so, as you can see in this diagram, the design flood elevation of our site is at 13 feet plus 13 feet. 
that is 12 feet flood elevation plus one. And our building is 470 feet tall, which puts the top of the building at 483 feet approximately. This is of course designed to current design, current zoning regulations. And regarding any of the new rules that might be introduced in the near future by the proposed zoning for coastal flood resiliency text amendments, these amendments will not change our, the height of our building or the gross area or the massing of our building. So our building will not get taller, bigger in volume or in gross area. But in addition to the design flood elevation, we also wanted to take today, uh, take this opportunity to talk briefly about the design um, uh, sustainable and uh, well-being oriented and resiliency oriented design aspirations and aspects of our project. And um, I'm Yasmin Kolog, the design director from SOM um, in charge of the project, but I also lead uh, globally our SOM's climate action group uh, aiming to address climate change and its negative impact on our environment. So we take this opportunity today to talk a little bit about um, the principles that SMM applies to all of our designs. So these 10 principles that you see on the screen apply to all our designs on every project and they vary from, they cover a broad range of topics, uh, broad aspects as well. And we believe that these are principles that cover a robust and broad spectrum, particularly designed to benefit the well-being of our people, community and planet. And it is exactly our goal for this project also. So these principles are ecology, aiming to leverage and protect nature, economy for a low carbon urbanism for all, energy and carbon for our future, uh, water valuing every drop, resiliency adapting to climate change and future changes, livability and well-being, design places where people can thrive, mobility, sustainable connectivity. Materials and resources specify responsible, efficient and low carbon materials. Waste, do more with less and reduced waste and heritage and identity, key also to this project. And today in the essence of time, we will not go through every single uh, aspect and our design in, every, in detail. However, we would like to take part of this time today to outline a few key ones that are relevant in today's conversation. So starting on the ground floor, we will highlight a few sustainable design elements. This is a view from Water Street looking south you can see our building and active shop fronts on the right side of this image. You can also see our design proposes to continue the active ground floor character of the seaport district. We have retail, community space, and residential amenities on the ground floor. Our ground floor fo follows a natural street topography like many other buildings in the district. And again, this means that like many other buildings in seaport, we have to carefully consider design flood and design for flood resiliency. So all interior spaces on the ground floor, including all retail units, residential lobbies, amenities, as well as community space have been designed to be flood proofed. And our design incorporates a set of active and passive measures to achieve this. As we go, as move up, we move up in the building. <clears throat> um, can you still hear me? Yes, terrific, thank you. Okay, uh, I think my screen, my computer froze, so I will not be able to advance slides, it looks like. Let me, um, yes. Um, so maybe I will need to talk to, um, talk to it, or somebody else maybe can take the screen if that works. Uh, as we move, we move up to building, uh, sustainability and well-being have been integral um, uh, integral part of our design and particularly with the creation of loggias, terraces and gardens on almost every floor of the, pro of, of the project, including MIH housing and offices too. And the current pandemic that we are in at the moment has highlighted once again the importance of our everyday well-being and these terraces provide access to outdoor spaces for residents and give access to nature and views for all occupants. And many of them incorporate green plants and landscape areas using native reduce irrigation needs and contribute to the biodiversity and habitat of the area. And these terraces also give us an opportunity to collect rainwater that is then used for irrigation purposes of the landscaped areas and gardens that we mentioned. This way, we aim to reduce rain and storm, storm water runoff the site, reduce potable use for irrigation purposes, 
and also contribute to well-being of occupants and biodiversity of the neighborhood. And finally, we also would like to briefly mention a few of the overall building strategies on energy and carbon efficiency. Our project is designed for compliance with the 2034 carbon emissions cap set by the local law 97. Many of you might be familiar with this law already, a law that moves us in New York towards carbon neutrality by 2050. And our design aims to achieve the 2034 cap by incorporating the following design measures, though not limited. It looks like we've lost Yasmin. Um, Diana is, is there? A... I just transferred presenter status to Mimi, who I think is uh, opening the presentation now. Mimi, you should be able to uh, go into the share, the share option in the menu and share uh, your whole screen or a particular application. And I keep an eye out for Yasmin, who I'm assuming will be uh, coming back in as soon as she's able to. Okay, uh, great. I think this is not. So you all see my screen or not? Yes. Okay, great. So let me just advance this. I think she was around this slide. That's correct. Alice, is our, uh, Diana, is Yasmin showing up in your roster at this point? Uh, not right now. I'm monitoring the uh, the incoming members to, to see if she's coming back in, but it looks like she was uh, fully booted. Adam, if we had Laura Dodge, who's going to speak to the Brownfields questions, yeah. have this minute. Okay. Would yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I think Yasmin was almost done. So we we could we could come back to to cover this if we if we right. need to. Okay, so just gonna and, uh, you'll just continue. Okay, great. So well, yeah, we'll we come after. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Sorry. Okay. Sorry for the, yeah. the technical malfunction I had earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, Adam and Laura. Just a minute. Let me just be clear. Adam, do you want to continue with your presentation and then have Laura come in after? Laura Donna. Well, I think I think I'd, I'd prefer to, to wait since we lost Yasmin until she's back on. But if in the meantime, if it's more efficient to have Laura go, we can do it that way. Okay. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it will be pretty brief and then it kind of dovetails into what Mimi presented. And so it actually might make more sense having me come after Mimi anyway, so. Okay, I, I appreciate the brevity, Laura, that you're guaranteeing, yeah. <laughs> and if you'd be good enough to just introduce yourself to the yes. community at large, and thanks yes. very much. Yes, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Dodge, um, president of Excel Environmental Resources. Uh, we're the community consultant for um, reporting directly now to CB1 and to the community in the South Street Seaport area in general. Um, so we've been involved since the initial dis, uh, issuance of the draft remedial investigation work plan and provided a lot of comments and input uh, to that document. And then um, in uh, coordination with uh, the NYSDEC and DOH, uh, and Langan, um, and the community consultant for the Blue School, Tom Facillo, we've been uh, monitoring and providing active input during the five phases of the remedial investigation as it proceeded, um, reviewing those results and then having discussions with DEC and DOH uh, regarding the results and the scope of work and the thoroughness and um, completeness of the remedial investigation. So we actually had our um, last 
call with the agencies uh, yesterday to talk about um, the overall completion of the RI and whether or not, you know, we felt Tom Fasil and I on behalf of the community and whether or not the agencies felt that the RI was sufficiently complete to be able to proceed to an RI report. Um, and we agree that with the agencies that we are at that point, um, with the understanding that there may be some additional field work uh, to complete some compliance aspects of delineation, not anything that would necessarily change the direction of any remedial action that would take place. It would just be for wrapping up some fine tuned details. Um, so, uh, answering a few maybe minor questions. Um, however, we agree that proceeding with the remedial investigation report is the appropriate next step. And that there's sufficient data to then also proceed with um, issuance or, or pre preparation and issuance of a remedial action work plan. Um, so I'm happy to report that we're at that stage. And I think uh, Mimi had already indicated that uh, on behalf of HHC, Langan is preparing the remedial investigation report. Um, and that the EIS, the draft EIS um, section uh, for hazardous materials can then incorporate the findings of the remedial investigation, which is the appropriate, um, you know, order of uh, proceeding with that, because obviously with all the information generated from the RI, which was very comprehensive, um, you know, that will help to inform that portion or that chapter of, of the EIS um, itself for the redevelopment, the proposed redevelopment. Um, so I actually had um, been asked, even though it wasn't directly in my work scope as a courtesy to the CB1, I, I did review the city's proposed draft uh, our EIS scope of work for the environmental components um, of, the, of the project, which basically the hazardous materials section. Um, and, and I found it to be um, completely appropriate and very comprehensive. Um, it, it directly addresses um, the fact that, you know, there's an ongoing um, investigation as part of the Brownfields Cleanup Program application that HHC um, has been implementing. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is that that information, which has now been generated, will then be used to inform um, the hazard, hazard materials section of the EIS report, the draft, and then ultimately the final. Um, I think with the intention of ultimately by the time the final EIS report is issued, hopefully the remedial action work plan will have been developed to the point where the conceptual remedy can also be discussed uh, in the final EIS report. Um, so I think that's the goal. And um, I think it seems like the timeline um, is moving you know, aggressively in that direction. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, if you want me to get to anything specific. Um, Laura, thanks very much. I think we'll complete the presentation uh, by the 250 Water Street team, and then we'll ask if you can please stay on so that we can take all the questions at the end, and I'm sure there'll be a few. So, Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. So um, Adam and team, are you able to uh, resurrect the presentation at this point? Uh, I am back on. And I apologize. Uh, I don't know no what happened there, but I'm not the presenter again, so if I can't be. Uh, where was the last point that you heard me that will help me? Uh, I think, Yasmin, it was um, the first street perspective was still up. Okay. Um, you were, I think we heard you a little bit, but the slides weren't advancing, I think, okay. beyond that point. So maybe the second street view. Okay, I apologize about that. Um, so, um, uh, so I was saying on the street view, actually, that we have, uh, just like many other buildings in the Seaport District, our ground floor also follows a natural street topography. And like many other buildings in the Seaport, we have to carefully consider design flood resiliency. So therefore, um, all interior spaces on the ground floor, including all retail units, residential lobbies, and amenities, uh, as well as community space have been designed to be flood proofed. And our design incorporates a set of active and passive flood measures to achieve this. 
And as we move up the building, as you can see in this image, uh, sustainability and well-being have been an integral part of our design, and particularly with the creation of loggias, terraces, gardens on almost every floor, including MAH housing and offices also. And current pandemic has highlighted once again that um, the importance of our everyday well-being. So these terraces provide access to outdoor space for residents, give access to nature and views for occupants also. And many of them incorporate green plants and landscape areas, particularly focusing on native coastal plants with low maintenance and reduced irrigation needs, all contributing to the biodiversity and habitat of the area. And these terraces also give us an opportunity to collect rainwater that is then used for irrigation purposes of the landscape areas and gardens. And this way, we also aim to reduce rain and stormwater run off the site and reduce portable use for irrigation. And also contribute to well-being of occupants and biodiversity of the neighborhood. If you could please go to the next slide. We also would like to briefly mention a few of the overall building strategies on energy and carbon efficiency. Our project is designed for compliance with the 2034 carbon emission cap set by the local law 97 in New York. Many of you might be familiar with this law already, a law that moves us in New York towards carbon neutrality by 2050. And our design aims to achieve the 2034 cap by incorporating a few design measures, not limited, but a few of them are following. Efficient facade systems, refined window wall ratio throughout, daylight optimization throughout, efficient lighting in all spaces, efficient MEP systems, etc. And in addition, we are also considering options for future electrification of our building, particularly building systems, to leap towards carbon neutrality. And as our electricity grid becomes greener and more renewable, we will be making the leap towards carbon neutral 2050 as well. And finally, our project is currently targeting a LEED certification, which we will not talk in detail today, but as many of us might know, it, it helps us consider many other aspects of sustainability and well-being also. So with this, we try to highlight a few of the sustainable and well-being oriented and resiliency aspects considered on our design. And we hope that this helps explain some of the design aspects and principles adopted in this project. And thank you for your time. I'd love to hear your comments and questions. Thanks. So this is the end of the presentation, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Thank right. you. All right. So um, I, I want to open it up to the community board committee members first, followed by community board members generally, and then onward to the public. So anybody from the Environmental Protection Committee that would like to ask a question or ask a comment? And please raise your hand so Anna, I can see you. Alice, my hand is up. Sorry, <laughs> guess I'm not seeing it. Okay, Colin, thank you. Go ahead. I just say from the outset that I don't understand why we're talking about a big building on this property. For me, we need more parks, we need more in space. I personally think this is outrageous. But that being said, I'm very curious. You've talked a great deal about sustainability and climate and concern about climate change and concern about ensuring a building that adheres to what I think are outdated lead standards. How exactly do you plan on taking this building to carbon neutral? What, what specific steps will you be taking? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know if I would agree that LEED standard is outdated, uh, but that's one point of view. I do. Um, I think LEED standard um, is a quite a comprehensive standard in the sense that it looks at not one aspect, but many aspects of a project. And I think that's the, that, that has a lot of merit in it. And that's something we are also quite keen to uh, adopt in our projects. And um, in terms of um, carbon neutrality, um, I'm, I'm, we, I mean, as you know, um, New York City and state have particular goals. And actually, we, um, we are also working towards those goals. And as I mentioned, um, there are certain design aspirations and design design systems used um, and that we can talk to, which are the efficient facade system and um, uh, refined window wall ratio, optimization of daylight into interior spaces, um, efficient lighting in different locations, and also uh, efficiency of MEP systems are all the aspects that 
uh, we are considering in this in this project, and they all contribute positively to uh, on our path towards uh, carbon neutrality. And in addition, as as you might know, um, um, as as our green and New York's New York State also has a, a goal towards carbon neutral, carbon neutral grid. Um, and as we move towards that, as I mentioned, uh, we have considered and are considering options towards elect electrification, future electrification as well, uh, which could help us in the future to, um, achieve a carbon neutrality, basically. Alice, if you'll allow me a follow up. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, yeah, I, I know a little something about this and, and there is no possible way where this building can be carbon neutral. The technology doesn't exist. You're going to be drawing from the grid and the grid. Sorry, uh, someone was just uh, the, the grid, you're drawing from a grid, the grid that's already losing uh, renewable sources as it is in the city with the retirement of, of the nuclear plant. So I just I want you to be genuine when you talk to us about what you're trying to do, because there is no, I, I work in renewable energy and there is no technology available that can make this building remotely off grid, remotely carbon neutral. It just doesn't exist. So I, I'd like you to be very specific when you talk about these terms and not just glowing terms. I say lead certified uh, even gold or even silver is outdated because it's just not the re re real world we live in right now we need to build, need we need to build more aggressive buildings that adhere to a climate standard that just don't exist right now lead is 10 15 years ago that's what mattered then this is a more dire situation we're facing right now so anyway you know where i stand i don't i don't believe that a building should be built here especially one this tall that i think violates a whole bunch of historical standards but I just ask that you be honest with us when you talk about carbon neutral, or when you talk about off grid, when you talk about climate resiliency, because this building is none of those things. That's all. Um, I think we should remind ourselves that I, I totally understand where you're coming from, um, and I think we are we are basically uh, when we when we talk about carbon neutrality, I think we're talking about carbon neutrality, carbon ready, basically carbon neutral ready. And we're not talking about carbon neutrality on day one. And I think, as you know, uh, this is very much in line with the aspirations of the city and the state as well. Um, and that's been the aspiration for the design aspiration for this project also. And, and I would I would add that building building uh, density with with housing and workplace near very strong transit connectivity is a sustainable building practice. Sure, but again, let's be honest with what this is. You're you're minimizing impact. You're not being aggressively carbon neutral. You're not being consistent with the neighborhood. Let's be real with what this is. That's not any of that. I think uh, this. Uh, uh, go ahead, Wendy. Thanks. I have Adam. Colin, I was going to because one of the things that jumped out at me was the um, I guess what you're saying converting the um, fossil fuel burning systems that you have that they would be ready to convert or whatever the language was that that I read about and that you echoed. Um, you know, I, I immediately was thinking, well, you know, how about um, insulation? And, you know, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're going for a passive house standard, which is, you know, understandable. It's very expensive. Um, but I think that that would be something to Colin's point. If you're building at a passive house standard, which I know the city even hasn't totally acknowledged yet in terms of how that is, um, that that's bragging rights. Um, so, I, I, Colin, is that a fair assessment? I think that's well said. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and again, look, I know <laughs> I'm being I'm in a foul mood tonight. I apologize. It's been a rough couple of days for all of us, but um, I know you folks are trying your best. I know you're not the developers. I know you're you're presenting a design, but. At the same time, we're dealing with this with Governor's Island as well. You know, I work in climate. I've personally installed over three gigawatts of wind turbines and solar panels. Like, there's things you can do in a city, and there's things you can't do in a city. I would just appreciate that we don't carbon whitewash or climate wash what we're doing here, and just be honest with us. This this is not and never will be uh, climate neutral. It won't be off grid unless you guys are ready to, to dedicate. You know. $200 million of, of carbon credits to a wind company. It's just not the case. But yes, to answer your question, Wendy, uh, passive housing is a lot more aggressive than LEED, and, and I just think LEED is outdated. I'll, I'll be quiet now. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I think that's what we're just saying, is that this is more of a conventional building that's been built in recent years, 
in our neighborhood and not that that's a bad thing, but you know, it's, it's a more conventional building and that's what uh, we, we just don't want you to oversell it. Um, I, I also had another question just in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the water capture that you're talking about and, and is, is there some sort of cistern? Is there some sort of, um, you know, uh, gray water system that you're going to reuse to water the plants that are on the terrace? Is that something that each individual owner of the apartment would water their plants? Or is that something that the system itself would provide? Because a, a cistern to water the whole building, that's cool. That's That's something I haven't heard of. So I think we have also Sol Hayutin. Sol, are you on the call? I think you might want to talk to the details of uh, which parts. Um, I can't, I'm looking. Sol? But you were talking a little bit about capturing rainwater and- Yeah, yeah, so we, we, we are basically, we are, um, I think the, the terraces give us, I mean, you can imagine that um, there's many of this uh, conversation and strategies and discussion. And, um, there is the, the terraces actually provide us an opportunity to capture rainwater from them as part of the, as part of the drainage system, basically, then they, that will be then recycled to be used in the uh, irrigation of the, of the building. Is this all? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Sorry, well, I'm having you. some technical issues. This is Saul Hayton. I'm the uh, associate director of technical design for SOM. Um, as Yasmin was pointing out, um, we are currently, we have a detention system in the, in the basement to meet DEP requirements. But on top of that, we also have a reclamation uh, system that's using for um, irrigation on our landscape. Um, as Yasmin pointed out, we have several terraces throughout the whole building and the loggias. So we're re we're using ra water rain off, uh, water runoff, rainwater runoff to irrigate the, the landscape that's throughout and it is inherent to the design of the project. Um, could we get a little clarity on that, if you don't mind? Just are we talking about the terraces that are at the top of the podium? You're certainly not talking about the terraces in the towers, but you're talking about the ter terraces on the above the po at the roof of the podium, and um, and how many square feet are we talking about, approximately? Um, I I don't know how many square feet offhand, but we have about four or five different terraces. You can see in this image here. Um, and so these terraces wrap around the entire podium of the building and are heavily landscaped. And we're looking into possibilities of, of the loges above as well. Well, I guess it would be really helpful in the next round of this if there's, you know, as we move forward, if, if we could get some of those specifics, it would be helpful in terms of the materials, the sort of, you know, mechanics of the building um, vis a vis a lot of these questions about. Um, you know, carbon neutrality and other sort of projections, uh, you know, at some point, if that could be provided square footage of the terracing that's allowing for this rainwater, you know, uh, absorption and such. Yeah. 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 Yep. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we're on to Michael. Uh, Wendy, I'm sorry, were you finished with your question? Did you have anything else? I, I think I'm I'm fine. You can move to the next person. Thank you so much. Okay, Michael Frankauer. Great, thank you, Alice, and thanks everyone for the presentation. And Alice and Wendy, jump in if my my question is off topic. I, I apologize, but I was looking at the document that was circulated in the agenda of the um, draft uh, environmental review uh, impact statement. And I was looking at the diagram, and I was wondering if you could clarify. It seems like on the ground floor. There might be, a, is it a private driveway? Is that what is there? And I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on what is going to be on the ground floor and if you guys are building car infrastructure into this building. I think about 30. There is parking uh, below ground in, in this building. Um, and that that is a, a uh, a driveway to uh, enable vehicle uh, drop off off of the street. Gotcha. And, uh, okay. I think it's just designed with the intent to keep you know traffic out of the historic district to the greatest extent possible. Did you say that there's parking underneath the building? Adam? I... Correct. Correct. Did we have we seen any plans for that? Have you shown plans of the, of that underground level? 
Um, I, I don't think we have plans for it. I don't know if we've shown them to you specifically. Okay. Well, that could be added to the pile of what we'd like to see next, if you don't mind. That would be interesting to know in the section that shows that. I, I just don't remember seeing it, and I think it'd be helpful to know what's going on underneath the building and what proposed to go underneath the building. Thanks. I'm sorry to interrupt, Alice. I just was 530 something what I said about, right? You're breaking up a little, Wendy. Could you repeat what you said? I said, I think I read something like it's 130 something parking spots that just in my in the ballpark. Right. I don't think that's been discussed very much. Um, thanks for the reminder. Yeah. And so one follow up, if I if I may, Alice, is it OK? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so my understanding when you're building like car infrastructure, like a driveway and, and parking is that uh, it follows the, the field of dreams principle, which is uh, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so I'm wondering how that it, that seems like it doesn't. Well, I guess our geographic area, I think we probably have. Uh, I think the lowest concentration of car ownership in the city uh, and seeing like a driveway like this seems relatively rare. Um, I guess there, there are some buildings with parking below them, um, but there's there's plenty of paid parking lots in our district. And as you said, it's very well served by public transportation. And we know that additional car traffic and vehicles emit greenhouse gas emissions and we're in a very uh, low lying uh, area of the city, very vulnerable. This is in the floodplain. So it seems like adding that sort of infrastructure flies in the face of some of the sustainability goals that you guys uh, are, are trying to achieve. And I, I think that uh, also doesn't align very well with the community board's priorities. So I just wanted to make that comment and had a question as well about, it seems like the ingress and egress for the proposed um, uh, driveway slash access to the parking one is on gosh is it little west street and one's on beekman and i just wanted to raise a like a safety concern i know there's two schools there and given the popularity of trucks and suvs and how like hood heights are raising uh it seems like we're adding possible uh, areas of conflict between uh children walking around and cars having to drive over the sidewalk uh, to get into uh, this parking so i just wanted to raise that as a concern very much, Michael. Good points um, to be considered. Um, I'm just checking through the, if you just take your hands down, unless you have a second question, which we can entertain. I see Colin and Wendy probably. Okay, I see Bob Steck. Uh, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about Passive House because I've worked on that a fair amount. And I just wanted to mention that Passive House is far more economical than it was several years ago, and that uh, there are a number, number of successful examples. Some buildings have been brought in uh, under budget compared to conventional buildings. So I think if there's any interest in this, uh, I, could, um, I could get some analysis of that possibility. The next question, the first, question I have is about gray water. If there is going to be uh, water collection resiliency, uh, are you going to work with gray water systems in a building like this, or is that done in New York? Saul H, do you want to take this one? Hi. Hi. Uh, so far, we, we have, uh, we're still vetting through different ideas we could use for the rainwater and, and uh, gray water and so forth. Um, so we are considering that. Uh, you know, we have to consider it further. Okay. And then I was, I'm very interested in just as a matter of knowledge, I'm interested how you achieve um, uh, flood water resiliency on the first floor. So uh, let me, let me take that one as well. Uh, flood water resiliency in terms of, uh, so as Yasmin pointed out, the flood, what we're, pro what we're planning to do is do uh, flood proof glazing along with a robust uh, uh, solid surface of precast, which is the, uh, which is in line with FEMA regulations for flood proof uh, materials. And that is throughout the entire base of our building in order to keep the flood waters out. So that and means if there's a, Sorry, in front of doors, we will be putting in uh, the flood locks. 
So it sounds like if if I had a shop behind the front window, then it would be completely sealed off if there was a if there was a flood surge into this area. That's that's correct. That's the intent of it. And is that the the, the common way that going forward? New buildings like this and retrofits are going to be handling uh, flood well, the, resiliency in downtown. I mean, the city is constantly investigating different ways of dealing with flood, and it's uh, ever evolving as the technology evolves. So there's active barriers and uh, non-active barriers. One way of doing it is actually have an active wall that would pop up. We felt this was that was not uh, it was not applicable at this at this location. So their way is the flood proofing glazing. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies you can, you can employ to do it. Thank you so much. It's great to know. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Bob. Can I just ask a follow up on that? And this is a follow up to a question I think I asked um, at some hearing. Um, the zoning for coastal flood uh, text amendment, you know, enters into this and um, assuming that the text stays as it's it is today, um, it's ratified. Um, how would this affect uh, the building? In other words, you're dry proofing the ground floor. So would there be a for, you know, exempt space within 30 feet of the street wall um, on the ground floor? Uh, would you yeah, in other you words, take, take it again? So this is all good. Um, we're, we're currently uh, looking into that, but we have not um, decided if we're going to take the optional uh, um, uh, optional um, area if the text goes through or not. Currently, you know, currently we're still talking to the city, working with city agencies um, to see if it's appropriate or not. Could you just flesh that out a bit? A bit, a bit. What does it mean if it's appropriate? Um, you could take 30 feet deep on all sides of this lot on the ground floor, of your building on the ground floor, and that floor area would be exempt. What's the pro and con here, or what's the, the sort well, of it's, considerations? It's, it's, the, the city has made it an option, uh, so it's not a requirement. So that's one of the reasons I'm saying we're trying to decide if it makes sense or not, because there's a lot of other rules and regulations that would come with it. When do you think you would be? Well, you're going to, I guess, wait. Uh -huh. I, okay. All right. Well, it's, it's an option that you're considering, I guess, is what we're learning. Yeah, that's okay. correct. All righty. Um, let's see. Um, do we have anyone else from the community board um, that would like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay. It looks like I don't have a case if something comes up. Also, keep in mind that we also have questions for Laura Dodge about the Brownfields, if any other uh, remediation plan, if anyone would like to ask that. Otherwise, I'm going to move into the attendees. Um, uh, Alice, I still see hands up for Colin, Michael, and Wendy, but I, I don't know if those are from previous questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. is... Wendy, you have another question? Yeah, and I, I think it was a long line of building this building because one of the things I just heard is that there's this concept of building a, a bathtub of sorts, and especially if there's going to be 120 or 150 some parking spaces below, and we know that it's the groundwater at this point is pretty high um, and it was built on fill from, you know, the you know beginning of civilization in, in New York City. Um, I'm just curious, um, is there any innovative design or things that we're that you're thinking about in terms of, you know, God forbid there is another Hurricane Sandy, uh, you know, and, and I think the city is is doing things like they're trying to incentivize, not mandate how you handle, uh, you know, certain things um, and you're considering all your options, but I'm just wondering, you know, what is the plan for the, you know, the, you know, the build is going to take a, a little while. What is, what is the unusual plan since you're in a flood zone with Hurricane Sandy? Um, is, is there anything new and different versus any other construction site or is this, is this conventional? This is all again. I, I can take that one again. Um, so, so again, it's it's a question of how the technology evolves. 
in the city right now, you know, flood barriers and stuff are, are evolving with the times in Sandy. Um, so we are doing, I would say, more innovative practices now, such as the flood through blazing uh, versus putting up uh, barriers or, or logs that are, you know, the city has gone away from logs since they require uh, someone to come and put them in. So as the city progresses and the technology progresses, I think the flood proofing would as well. But we're being very diligent about uh, considering this because we definitely want to protect um, our, our, our residential uh, lobbies, the, the community space we're going to do, and especially the, the potential retail tenants that come and you know, become part of the city. I was talking about the actual building, not once it's finished. You know, because you're going to be building a bathtub type of structure in the basement. Um, and obviously, you've got to remove a lot of the mercury and petroleum and all the other horrible stuff around the site, which is, I think we're all incredibly concerned about that. But, um, you know, I think on top of it all, we're, we're just, I, I just, you know, with at least personally, I feel like if it could go wrong, it's going to go wrong. So I was just wondering if you were, um, you know, and maybe it's too soon to, to uh, who you're consulting, if, if this is going to be a conventional type of protection, or if you're going to do something above and beyond, uh, uh, you know, some firm, some organization to protect the site from flooding, because it is a brownfields cleanup site. And uh, I mean, your project has more on it than almost any project that's being built in New York City. Curious. Well, that's that's something that that Lang in and our our geotechnical team and our structural engineer they're all looking at, at that and working on it and and all those um, logistics are going to be you know continue to be fleshed out and and uh, you know that analysis and and those plans will also be you know subject to the um, environmental impact statement and that review so there there'll be a lot more to to talk about on that uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. We're just hoping that you're going to be cutting edge. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you have another question? Michael. Yes, I do. Uh, so just on the topic of noise pollution, a lot of uh, large buildings have vents that are located close to the street level and they end up, uh, I think it's, I don't know why they're technically there, but I'm assuming it's related to heating. Um, but it often causes a lot of noise that can be hostile to a, a streetscape and a lot of buildings point them to the, I don't know, the rear of the building uh, where there's not much street activity. I was just wondering, have your plans progressed to a point that you know where such events would be located if there are any on your building and if that noise would be um, audible at the street level and where that would be? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all again. Um, a lot of our events are currently located on the second story facing Pearl Street. Uh, So we have to meet all those criteria, which are far more advanced than they have been in the past. Uh, Michael, good. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let's see. I've got Michael Kramer. Hi. My question is about the um, the challenge of uh, coastal resiliency and the seaport. Um, as you probably know, Reach C is being heavily studied right now, and they really don't have a good solution. Now, by adding all of this density to a 19th century neighborhood, I can understand how you're going to protect your building. Are you also studying the effect of protecting your building and what, it'll ha what that protection will mean for the surrounding uh, three and four and five story buildings? Uh, also, the question about wind, Have you are you going to be studying the effect of wind currents uh, in this area, which can be pretty, pretty uh, tough off of the East River, as uh, Adam is aware, you know, having uh, been up on Pier 17's rooftop many times. I, I can speak to that. Um, so, with regard to the effects of climate change, the draft scope of work points out that the EIS will include an assessment of uh, the potential impacts from climate change and the effects of the project. It does not call out specifically um, the effects on, on the surrounding community. So it's, it's really more a question of resiliency within the building is what is 
presented uh, consistent with the secret technical manual. And then on your second question about uh, pedestrian wind, the secret technical manual again says that where you have multiple tall buildings directly along the waterfront that you would study pedestrian level wind. Here we're set back from the water, the building would be set back from the waterfront and moreover the towers are set back from the street such that any wind coming down the building would be broken up by the base. So the draft scope of work does not uh, suggest that a pedestrian wind study would be undertaken. So you're saying we will we will not see any effect about wind conditions, and you're saying that water won't find its way into the historic district. The it's two things. So the EIS will not study, or at least as far as the draft scope of work is presented today, would not study pedestrian level wind conditions. Um, water finding itself into the historic district. I mean that that the historic district is water side of the project. So. You know, to get to the project site, there would certainly be water in the historic district. Right, but your density would add to that. Hey, uh, this is Saul. This is Saul again. Um, also, in terms of wind, just in, on two points, in terms of wind, we are, you know, as, as Wesley pointed out, we are studying uh, the wind effect on the building and pedestrian uh, comfort as well. We're, we're conducting some studies uh, right now with the Institute in Colorado. Um, and then as far as, uh, um, is the concern you're bringing up about adding flood water to the area? Or uh, I'm a little confused because we're off, we're off of the waterfront. No, so we have eight, we have eight and a half feet of water on our cobblestones. And if, you, if it doesn't go into your building, it's gonna go somewhere else. So, so cur currently uh, as a, Comparison. Currently, there's an empty parking lot there with no protection or no uh, of any sort for run, uh, rainwater runoff. Um, as part of the building, we're actually required to put some protection in there. So, for instance, the detention tank in the in the basement helps to control water rain off or water runoff. So it helps to limit the amount of water that's going to to the uh, CSO system in the city. Um, on top of that, our our several roofs and several terraces. Help to collect that run that rain rain runoff as well. So I would actually say we're providing a better resilient uh, approach by putting a building there versus a a uh, parking lot that has no control. And how large will that stormwater detention tank be? Uh, it's meeting DEP requirements, um, but also DEP is currently they're looking at other requirements. Uh, and so we will meet those requirements for sure. But again, we're also using some of that run, runoff water for irrigation as well. So it's not purely just for detention. Thank you. Um, I'm, I just have one question before I forget it. Um, why, I, am I right in assuming that the sanitation or reading that the sanitation and solid waste are screened out? Um, and if that's so, why is that so of the analysis? Charlie, can you address that or Wesley? Yeah, so I think Charlie, correct me if otherwise, but, but the sanitation, uh, potential effects on sewage infrastructure would be studied as part of the EIS. But solid waste, not? Sanitation, I mean, that these are sort of separate categories that's, that I thought I had read. These, these particular areas were screened out based on the manuals, you know. Yes, hi, it's, I, I, it's Charlie. Um, I have to look at that specific one, but, um, you know, using the EAS, which is the document intended to set the stage for um, outlining the impact areas in the draft scope of work, um, there are baseline calculations that are done consistent with the guidance in the seeker technical manual. And it's the same for all of the different um, technical areas, you know, whether it's traffic or um, solid waste. Um, and if th the numbers are not are below the threshold requiring analysis, then the analysis is not done. And so, Charlie, so I, I have it here, Alex. Go ahead. Go ahead. If I could, I think I see what you're referring to. So, it, 
uh, uh, an analysis of what the demand for water would not be undertaken because it has screened out of, for that purpose. So water coming into the building, but it's, it's determined that the water system is sufficient to serve the building. On the other end, sanitation and runoff coming from the building into the sewer system, that analysis would be undertaken as part of the EIS. Okay, that's good to know. I guess I missed it. Uh, I, is it, could, at some point, could you just um, send us a note as to where that is? I didn't, I didn't see it um, as part of the um, Page document. 16 of the scope. Okay, thanks. At least somehow missed it. Thanks very much. Okay. So I've got Bob Schneck, your hand is back up, or is that a previous hand? I'm back up. Okay. And I think we'll limit it to three. Okay, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on the, if this project is trying to make good on the claim of carbon neutrality, then passive house is a big, is a big issue. So is a big is a is an important step forward or an important thing to consider. Um, I think Colin made the point that uh, that the plans as you have them really don't reach um, carbon neutrality as you might. Uh, Wendy kind of introduced the idea of passive house. Uh, I've analyzed over the years lead and lead falls short of passive house, although there's lots of admirable qualities about it. Uh, passive house, when you look at local art 97, in the development of that, there were lots of passive house ideas and we're currently working on uh, on making uh, passive house part of the New York State Conservation Code. And we're pretty close to achieving that. So all of these things are coming together. So I really think, um, and want to more formally comment that passive house is something you really should look into if you want to really achieve significant levels of carbon neutrality um, without having in the future to depend on uh, more um, a more carbon neutral systems and utility systems, which will take a long while in New York, I think. The other question I want to ask though, in the Quality of Life Committee, we're very concerned about waste storage and pickup but, uh, and where big buildings like this store waste before pickup. Because if we look at the nearby Geary building, it covers half a block of almost uh, uh, over almost six, six feet high of trash. A building like this would produce comparable amounts of trash. And so our concern is, uh, or what, what we're trying to encourage is having storage inside the building before the um, before the waste pickup. So is that being considered in this building? Saul, do you want to speak to that? Saul H. The, the, the answer is, I mean, this is, um, the answer is yes. I think I'm, I'm calling on um, Saul because he's, he's more familiar with the details of that strategy. But, but yes, it's, it's there, there won't, the, the intent is not for trash to pile up on the street outside of the building. That's, that's uh, and, and I just wanted to ask if there's a, a more, uh, more robust commitment to carbon neutrality than the building that was presented to us so far today. Uh, I, I think that's a point that I should clarify. The building is not designed to be carbon neutral today. And I think I want to be, and we didn't declare that. I think I want to be very clear on that. I think what we're saying is that um, we are on a path as, as New York City and built environment in New York City, we're on a path towards that. And local law 97 and other energy codes, et cetera, are all moving towards that. And we are, we are targeting along that journey. We're targeting the 2034 goal along that journey. And of course, but this doesn't mean that future opportunities are not present for carbon neutrality of our built environment in New York. And that's the goal of the city and state um, that with the cleaning of the grid, et cetera. So I just want to be clear that this building is not designed to be carbon neutral. Uh, I'm asking whether or not you've made a serious consideration of thing, of an approach like passive house. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we have considered several rating systems, but that will be part of the future discussions, I believe. But thank you for bringing that up. Passive House is a good, um, good certification system, as you mentioned. And, and I, I wonder if you're interested in making any connections with that. Okay, well, let's, I think that's... that's you're, you're welcome to share, um, Bob, any, any information you have with us in that regard. We'll, we'll take it into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to open this into the attendee list now, Diana. Uh, I think we've covered, unless there's any other community board members that haven't spoken. Um, if I've got everybody, I'm going to move into the attendees. Um, I just also want to mention that um, you mentioned the solid waste and sanitation is noted in the document. It is noted as water and sewer infrastructure. Is that what you're saying? That solid waste and sanitation is synonymous with the water and sewer infrastructure on page 16? Yes, that's correct. So those terms are interchangeable. Okay. Well, no, there, there's actually, so, there's, but... there's two different things there. Um, one of which is the solid waste itself, which is um, basically DSNY handling of solid waste um, and the capacity for that and how much would be generated by the proposed project itself. Um, and the other one relates to uh, water supply and uh, sanitary wastewater uh, flow. All right. Well, I guess that'll get clarified as, as it goes forward. Okay. Thanks again. All righty. So on to the um, attendees. I've got Emily Halstrom. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, Emily, are you... Diana, can we? Are you I'm here. here. Can you hear me? Oh, terrific! There you are. Great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you? I just um, I'm wondering. Um, I have um some members of Children First here along with myself. Um, wondering if we could sort of speak uh, together, even back to back. Um, there I have um, Megan Malvern and um, Grace Lee as well. Um, and if we could sort of push our eight minutes together, if you don't mind. Yeah, as long as we don't go over the two minute uh, limit each, I have no objection. That seems to adhere to our general rules, but you know, faster okay. the better, because we do have a you know, governor's island behind us. So I really would ask that, yeah, we economize. Anyway, I, shall, I will let you. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much um, for all of you and to the applicant. Um, my name is Emily Hillstrom and I'm here on behalf of a Children First, um, an organization that represents um, over 600 families um, in uh, the greater area of either the Seaport and FIDI and beyond. Um, and so I just want to start by saying that um, that First of all, just thanking you, the community board. Um, we just want it for the record to be noted that the applicant and by default, the administration is putting this community board and the public in an untenable situation, um, trying to make expert comments and be a watchdog and check and balance with two ULERP applications, a landmarks, a brownfield plus Governor's Island and coastal resiliency all at the same time during a global pandemic. Um, so I just really want to put that on the record and say, we need to slow down um, and not to, you know, we, we need to do the proper work, which you guys are doing an heroic effort, but this is this is deeply technical things that are um, under normal circumstances would be in each committee potentially with, with further questioning, but this is all happening at once um, in a big rush job. So I just want to note that for the record, um, more time for us to be able to look over this after like a nine and a half hour landmarks would be fantastic. Um, in the um, um, the scoping document, it talks about neighborhood character. Um, I want to note um, that it wasn't noted that um, the site is 500 feet from the um, Smith houses, uh, NYCHA housing, affordable housing, Section 8 housing, um, and it is a thousand feet from the Smith House's outdoor play area, um, which is, sits in a different community board. And to my knowledge and understanding, they have not been notified, um, nor has it gone in front of community board three. Um, and they have been excluded from both the Brownfield and the EIS. Um, the lot, as we all know, sits within the boundaries of the National Historic and Special Landmark Districts. Um, but I think that people need to know, and obviously you start to touch on shadows, but um, that this, the scope really needs to look 
Um, I, I think it's quite narrow right now, um, particularly with regard to um, our open space and our National Historic District Special Landmark District. Um, gross shadows would be falling on the Brooklyn Bridge Promenade. Um, it's a thousand feet from the Smith Houses outdoor play area, which would be bathed in shadow um, among another a number of um, open spaces, uh, including almost the entire Seaport District. Um, and all of the open spaces that lie therein, as well as the um, National Historic Register, Brooklyn Bridge, and um, the ships, historic ships. Um, we also um, wanted to talk um, within the open spaces. It, it just, you know, there seem to be a couple of mentions of open spaces, and I just want to make sure that, um, and we, we put this in a document that we submitted to you. Um, there are a number of open spaces that are not mentioned. Um, and really, because of these shadows, really, um, it the scope is quite large, frankly. Um, and then um, the other thing that uh, we just want to mention is uh, that there is um, also other affordable housing in the neighborhood, 700 plus affordable units. Um, and somehow that is not anywhere in your scope. Just wanting to um, make note of displacement um, issues that do arise when um, building a big um, high rise luxury affordable um, um, double towers. Um, we understand that you are doing the sort of minimum um, that is required by the law of the mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, and it seems to me to be a fluctuating number. Um, at one point I heard 150 units, um, then 100 units, and now it's down to 90 units. So I just, you know, it would be interesting to sort of get a, a pin down on that. Um, and then I will just pass it over to Megan Malvern, who wants to talk about some of the environmental impacts. Thanks so much. Okay, Megan, you should be all set. Um, do I, uh, no camera, camera, it doesn't matter. Okay, fine. I, I even put on mascara for you guys tonight and you're not going to see me anyway. <laughs> um, with all due respect, this should be paused and resubmitted once City finalizes the current still in development citywide tax amendments for coastal resiliency. Despite assurances from the developer heard during tonight's presentation to not change one single aspect of the design to activate the give backs, that's an empty promise. Once approved, the allowances are there, especially as an internal document shows from HHC, the plan all along is to sell this development to another one. So no matter what HHC and their planners say, the yet to be finalized changes to the city laws are at play here. In fact, there was a contradiction tonight among tonight's presenters. Yasmin said that there's nothing that they're gonna do that would change the, the scope or the um, shape, size, all of it, of the building. But then a little while later, it was talked about that they're considering this flood uh, proof glazing. This flood proof glazing is something that would, um, and is part of the further text amendments that's still under, like what I'm talking about, it's still under um, proposal and idea. Until the amendments are finalized and enshrined, the scope encompass, encompassing an acre wide development for construction inside a historic district with fragile buildings built in the late 1700s that sit directly across a high risk flood zone without a full understanding of this spe um, specifically, how these new rules will impact on the adjacent 250 year old buildings and the district is irresponsible. The scope doesn't recognize how this watertight building will deeply impact the area. No engineer has the ability to responsibly even predict what and how this building will pack until all the information is codified. I lived through Sandy in the seaport and before he was talking about how it's such a bad part of the seaport and could have done a better job protecting. I lived here. I saw what happened at 250. That lot took the force and the power of a seven foot tall um, storm surge that was barreling down these roads and let them dissipate and lose energy. What's gonna happen when that same seven foot tall wall jams down these streets and smashes into a 17 foot tall sealed glass encampment directly opposite the most fragile buildings and likely I'd say arguably all of New York City. Um, the proposed building without a replacement to that benefit is selfish and irresponsible. And they're instead prioritizing a parking garage. This building as proposed will cause harm to the longevity and sustainability of the district at large. And what are the oldest and most cohesive grouping of original structures in the country. Therefore, 
I urge that we all put this thing on pause until we can understand exactly what this design will be and exactly what the law regarding the new text amendments will be. I also want to just point out that as far as the draft is concerned, this draft is less than what my son, my son in sixth grade would have to turn in. A draft requires, and I was just reading from some of his notes today, you begin with research. It's an assignment that asks you to do research to support your points and to learn more about your topic. Doing that research is an important early step. They go on to explain that you should do a bunch of different stuff. Interview, create um, uh, and administering a survey, uh, looking at local articles, visiting the study, your study subject, creating a database of scholarly articles and studies that will inform your draft. None of that is presented to this public. We don't know if they're using a study from the 70s or a study from 2000 to talk about what any of these impacts might be on something that hasn't been talked about yet, the children in our neighborhood and the people of this neighborhood. It goes on to say research is a great early step. Learning what information is available from credible sources about your topic can sometimes lead to shifting your thesis. This scope presented by AKR, AKRF is entirely lacking any thoughtful or specific preliminary work to create a draft that can dependably reflect the impacts of HHC's modern waterproof high rise on a historic and fragile neighborhood. If this is really the best work that 350, and I'm quoting from their own website, professional staff that includes urban planners, economists, historians, air quality, noise analysts, it goes on and on and on. If this is the best that anyone can do, to give the community our only shot at framing the scoping work, then I think that maybe they should go back and try again. Anyway, at the end, I just urge that we insist this process is paused until there's a real data and a true building plan, a true building plan. We've already heard tonight how many times they're considering a couple options. Until that is all set down, we should be putting this on pause and we deserve more time, we deserve access to a document that is meant to inform and shape the impacts of this building, we deserve it to be better informed and more specific. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Grace Lee. Thank you. You're all set, Grace. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I want to re reiterate some of the comments that uh, Megan made on this EIS. I've spent countless hours reviewing this um, co alongside the Seeker Technical Manual to review whether this is a comprehensive scoping draft or not um, amidst having three children at home remote learning. So um, I just want to say that this has been an incredibly burdensome process to this community to have to do this especially when not a single time has a school or schools been mentioned in this scoping document. Um, I want to point out just for instance, um, in open uh, open spaces segment, where there is an opportunity in the secret technical manual, it says that privately accessible open spaces uh, can be considered. It does not look like in this draft scope document that that is something that will be considered. And the reason why that is important is that publicly accessible spaces do not include uh, public school open play space because it is not publicly accessible to the community. And it next to two schools that have that have children who depend on these open play spaces that are technically in some ways used by the community and public for that reason. These are not part of the draft scope of work that is being proposed here. So I'm incredibly disappointed in the fact that I, as a parent, have to go through the secret technical manual to determine whether that is this the scope of work is comprehensive or, or not is disappointing to me. Um, I do have some more technical questions for the for the um, for the team AKFR that prepared this draft scoping document. I'd like to understand better how you will be assessing specifically the health impact to the sensitive receptors in our community. That includes infants, that includes pregnant women who are working inside the schools, that includes mothers who are going to be walking their kids to school every day. I wanna understand how children as young as two years old 
are going how the risks to their health are going to be measured during this during the scoping work. Uh, I, can answer that, I can answer that, that last <laughs> question. Um, you, the scope of work does talk about um, public health considerations being part of the EIS. Um, you know, we follow the guidelines of the Seeker Technical Manual. Um, a public health assessment is typically warranted if you have unmitigated significant adverse impacts in certain key seeker analysis areas. Uh, those include air quality, uh, water quality, hazardous materials, uh, or noise. And each of those technical areas are considered in and of themselves. So there will be, um, you know, a thorough reporting of what uh, impacts may arise in those categories. But um, to the degree that they may affect public health uh, is also a consideration if there's unmitigated significant adverse uh, impacts. So it is something that will be looked at. Okay, um, just on that, I just also want to put on the record that I, um, I would like to see that the EIS um, uses the most recent, most recent published data um, to set the guidelines, safety guidelines for, um, for any standards that are going to be put in place um, during the construction and also um, post construction. I think it's important that um, we're not looking at data from 30 years ago to provide guidelines for um, what is considered safe. As we know that, you know, research has developed uh, quite a bit and the current guidelines are very different from before. Um, the other thing that I think is important to note is that sensitive receptors like children are way more sensitive to uh, toxic chemicals at much lower levels and that these, that should, these measurements should be included in any consideration of the public health impact to these, um, to these members of the community. Thanks very much, Grace. Um, and thanks to Children First and to the C4 Coalition. I know you've spent a lot of time reviewing all of this on behalf of the community, and that's very helpful. And of course, to the 250 Water Street team. Um, are there any other um, folks who would like to speak? I don't see any other hands myself, but Diana, maybe you I don't see any other hands, but I did get a uh, message from Adrian. So let me find them. Uh, I think they are no longer with us. So that's the uh, the last one that I have. Okay, great. So I think um, there are certainly areas uh, to fill in here. I uh, we Alice, will I'm so sorry to interrupt. Megan yeah. has uh, something additional to say. Okay, go ahead, Megan. Hi, thank you. I just want to say the idea to us is they are going to check into the schools. No specificity, which schools. There's a school that isn't listed um, that is on John Street. It is a special needs school. Um, there, there are so, how on earth can we assure that the schools and the environment is being represented and taken care of if there isn't a list for us to double check about? Like, we don't know what their list consists of. And if, as we have learned from the original Brownfield, there's a lot of stuff that gets lost in these lists. So my entire premise is we need more specificity to be able to have any sort of idea on how to help frame this scope, because none of it exists. Thank you very much. Um, it's a it's a it's a very fair point. Do you want to respond to that, um, Adam? Team, whomever, to the idea of providing more specificity generally on some of these questions that have come up tonight, and others that will, of course, appear in the comments from the community. Well, I mean, it, it's my it's my understanding that those the schools that could be impacted by this project will be careful. You know, th those impacts will be carefully studied. So we can we can go back and if uh, if Charlie has any specific comment tonight, he can make that now. But we can we can go back and look at that and make sure that you know we're we're covering everything appropriately. The entire right. Smith House was left off of your document 
So that's the kind of stuff. How do I know what isn't there if I can't see what's there? Well, I would just re try to remind everyone, you know, the and I, I appreciate that, you know, this is we're, we're very early on, you know, scoping is sort of the, the the beginning of the environmental review process. And the scope itself is not intended to be a comprehensive research document that, you know, talks about all the project impacts. It's just laying the framework for the methodologies that will go into the draft EIS. So in there, we will discuss what are sensitive receptors in the area as it relates to things like noise or um, air quality. Um, and the impacts on those will be assessed and presented in the draft EIS. And the public will have an opportunity as part of the process to review that document, which will have all kinds of information, a lot of it really technical. It, it's not easy to digest. Um, and to comment on that. Um, and then there will be a final EIS that's prepared, um, which will incorporate relevant comments um, uh, on the draft EIS. So, so we're just really at the beginning. And, um, you know, we will be taking a, a very hard look at all of these things uh, throughout the EIS process. How long will the community have between when you file the, the next version and when we have an opportunity to, because I don't know if you know, there's this entire project is being tracked on four different levels at the same time, and it is entirely result, insulting. Uh, I think yeah. that was a question as to the length of time that the community would have to review the next phase of the environmental impact work. Sure. So, so when the when the draft EIS is published, that that occurs just before the project is certified in, into the ULERT process, and so the public will have the chance to review the the draft EIS through the community board phase, through the borough president phase, and then finally to give comments at the city planning commission level. So it's about a four month time period from publication of the draft EIS. To the, to the hearing and uh, the comment period, close of the comment period. Which will never be in front of CB1 again, is that right? Because then it goes right into the ULERT process or it comes back to CB as the draft? It, it's at, the, the project as a whole is back at CB1 uh, as the first step after certification into the ULERT process. Okay, um, are you, you got that one, Megan, I, okay. So it, it, clearly there are a lot of eyes on this, a lot of concerns, a lot of interest. Um, uh, I know the community board intends to submit a letter with much of what was stated tonight and other concerns that we've compiled from other folks who have written it to the board. And that letter will be provided in time for Monday's final deadline. And I'm very hopeful that, and of course, all the other testimonies that you've received on this topic, and I'm very hopeful that you look at them very carefully. I think they're actually quite helpful in formulating the final draft and um, that this could be, you know, a, a healthy negotiation um, of, you know, forces of the community working with the development community to get this one right if it goes forward. So with that, I think I'm gonna close out 250 Water Street unless there's any final comments from anybody on that. Um, I don't see anybody there. Okay. Just want to thank all on that particular application. And we were going to move on and thank Laura also very much, Laura Dodge, for having attended and hung out here. I, and uh, very helpful. And I think we're going to move on to Governor's Island. Adam, did you have something you want to say? Thank, no, thank, thank you. I appreciate the time this evening. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. All right, so we're going to take a minute and sort of reset up for Governor's Island. Thanks again. Can someone from the Governor's Island team let me know who would uh, who you would like to be presenter on your end? Oh, great. Um, yes, thanks, Dano. If you could have Wesley as the presenter, he's going to do the sure. slide clicking tonight. 
Well, welcome, Governor's Island. Um, yes. Thanks so much, uh, Claire and Sarah and and all, um, Chris, and uh, for coming and hanging out. Um, it's you know not our fault that all these applications are at us at the same time. Doing our best to get them all <laughs> reviewed in a timely fashion. So thanks a lot. Um, anyway, uh, I think you look like you're ready to go. So without further ado, if you want to start, um, for everyone who is here still, um, obviously we're reviewing the Governor's Island Draft Environmental Impact Statement. It's not a scope of work, but the actual draft. Um, so, okay. Great. Um, thanks, Alice. So I'm going to kick it off and uh, we're joined by members of the Trust for Governors Island team tonight, particularly to help with Q&A. Um, that includes Chris Tepper, our Chief Development Officer, and Sarah Krautheim, our uh, VP of Public Affairs. And then Wesley O'Brien, who you just heard from, is also our uh, attorney on this project with Fried Frank. And I'll, I'll start with the slides and then I'm going to turn it over to Wesley. Um, so first off, let me just uh, Alice, say thanks to you and the entire board because um, we very much appreciate that you all have invested a huge amount of time in our application over the past few months, um, in addition to, it sounds like, a number of other applications before you. Um, so, yeah, whatever you guys need, we're happy, obviously, to be here and, and answering questions and discussing this. Um, Wesley, do you want to go to the next slide? So, um, just a quick recap to get us started of some of the other times we've been before CB1 in the past few months, primarily focused on the ULERP, although the slides that you'll see about the DEIS tonight were presented at um, the November 9th um, meeting as well. So um, as, as you guys all know, we were here on the 14th to talk about the Climate Center vision and then had a series of other meetings to focus on the different details around the ULERP package because we know it's a lot of information. Um, and then just a final thank you for the session on December 22nd. Um, we take very seriously all of the comments that we've received throughout this process, but um, in particular have been reviewing the letter, uh, excuse me, the recommendation from the community board and all the conditions in there. And as we've talked with you all about, we are continuing to work on those and we'll um, not let up on thinking through those issues and how we can adjust things as we move forward. So tonight we know really the idea is to focus on the DEIS um, and we just have a few slides to present to hopefully, you know, provide a little bit of grounding for the Q&A. Uh, next slide, Wesley. And then last thing, vis-a-vis um, -vis the overall process, again, as you all know, we've officially certified in October. Um, we have your formal recommendation now from December 20-something, and um, we're going to, as I said, continue with outreach, the ULERT process, and working with the community board over the next few months. Our goal for all of this um, has been and continues to be to release a solicitation focused on the Climate Solutions Center at some point in calendar year 2021. And obviously we've also committed to working with the board on the substance of that RFP. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Wesley to talk specifically about the EIS. Great, thank you, Claire. So, so for, regarding the EIS, I'm first gonna discuss the analysis framework that was used for the draft EIS. Then I'll provide a summary of the overall findings and finally, we'll take a closer look at the anticipated effects, effects and mitigation measures that have been identified with respect to a few of the environmental technical areas. So regarding the analysis framework, the draft EIS is actually the second supplement to the generic EIS that was originally issued in 2011. So in 2011, the, De the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development issued the generic EIS in, con in conjunction with conjunct construction of the park and open spaces that we all now enjoy. So while the redevelopment of the South Island and the retenanting of the North Island were, were anticipated at that time, there were no specific proposals, so generic assumptions were made at that time about what type of redevelopment would occur. Then in 2013, the, the trust applied for rezoning to allow for commercial uses on the North Island. At that time, the Office of the Deputy Mayor issued a first supplement to the generic EIS to, dis to assess whether the North Island rezoning would result in new or different impacts than were previously disclosed. So now, given that the, there's a proposal to rezone the South Island, a second supplemental EIS has been prepared to pr assess its specific effects and to determine, again, whether the rezoning would result in any new or different impacts than were previously disclosed either in the 2011 or 2013 EIS. 
So with respect to the analysis framework, <clears throat> the EIS looks at the, uh, the effects of the project and effects of the development that would occur uh, in 2030, which reflects an approximately 10-year build-out. And it's modeled on the development of the four and a half million gross square feet under two different development scenarios. Um, the two different programs are used as they would have different effects in different areas. So the idea throughout the EIS is to take in each technical area of analysis, the program, either the office research op option or the office research option, whichever program would have the worst or I should say most significant um, most potential for significant impacts to look at that in each of the technical areas to make sure that we are undertaking a conservative analysis and really uh, disclosing the full range of potential effects. So based on the two, de two development scenarios and using the seeker technical manual guidelines, the EIS concluded that there would not be significant impacts with respect to many technical areas. Uh, so, for example, with respect to socioeconomics, the, rezone, the EIS concluded that the rezoning would not cause significant socioeconomic impacts as a result of business displacement or residential displacement. Similarly, with respect to open space, given the amount of existing open space on the island and the amount of new open space to be created, the DEIS concluded that the open spaces would not be overburdened by the new population. Uh, on the other hand, there were significant impacts disclosed uh, with respect to transportation and construction, at least with respect to construction phase transportation. Um, so based on feedback that we've received, questions and comments that we've received through the process, today we're going to focus on the summary of transportation impacts and the proposed mitigations. Um, we're going to address a few concerns about construction, particularly as it might could affect island visitors, and we're going to take a detailed, more detailed look at the shadows analysis. So starting first with transportation, the EIS studied ferry landings at the BMB and Pier 6, studied a freight terminal at uh, Lima Pier on the island, and then potential freight transfer for locations along the Brooklyn waterfront. In all 52 tra traffic intersections, as well as 30 sidewalks and 20, 27 corners and 16 crosswalks were analyzed as part of the transportation study. In addition, three subway stations, five subway lines, and four bus lines were studied. As a result, potentially significant impacts were anticipated with respect to traffic, and pedestrian elements, and certain subway station elements. So with regard to the traffic impacts, the left column that's shown on the screen now uh, provides a breakdown of the number of significant impacts that were anticipated at intersections in Manhattan and Brooklyn, respectively, as well as the number of intersections that could be mitigated uh, or would be left unmitigated. Uh, on the right hand in the right-hand column, with respect to pedestrian impacts, um, there's a breakdown of the number of significant impacts that were projected with respect to crosswalks and corners in Manhattan, followed by the number of significantly impacted sidewalks. And again, in each instance, the breakdown shows the number of mitigatable versus unmitigatable in uh, intersections, or rather uh, uh, pedestrian elements that were identified. And this slide has a summary of, contains a summary of the transit analysis, and in particular, you see the three stations here that were analyzed. Overall, it was anticipated that the project could result in significant impacts at five stair subway stairways and one escalator. So while most of the impacts could be fully mitigated or partially mitigated, there was one stairwell which was determined to be left, uh, that would be left unmitigated. Now, because transportation systems are constantly evolving and the EIS looks ahead to the future, um, it, it, the trust has committed to undertake a transportation monitoring program through the course of development um, to confirm that the projections from the EIS, uh, rather the, the generic EIS, will uh, how they will play out going forward. So this will include looking at trips as we go forward to determine whether the trips actually materialize, and then more as critically to verify the need and effectiveness of the mitigation measures that were proposed. And then in doing so, the trust would be responsible for all costs, and associate, costs associated with the, T, the transportation monitoring program, including data collection, design and any mitigation measures, 
or I should say rather adjustments to mitigation measures at that time, and then construction of the capital improvements. Um, so, oh, going back. Here we are. Turning now then to construction. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the reasonable worst case, uh, the analysis looks at a 2030 build out. Uh, it, is, it is a worst case for purposes of construction to do so because it conservatively analyzes the effects of construction of multiple parcels at the same time overlapping with one another. Um, so, it, so it's a more intensive construction phase uh, than may actually occur, but it, it's therefore considered, for the, considered uh, conser to be conservative for the purpose of analysis. Um, as part of the construction analysis, uh, the EIS assumed that all construction workers would be traveling to the island via the BMB and that construction materials would be transported to the island by barge. Um, in the construction analysis, there were detailed analyses of transportation systems, air quality, and potential noise impacts. Um, as a result, the EIS anticipated the potential for, for unmitigated temporary impacts in Manhattan at two intersections and one crosswalk during the construction phase. Um, now, as par part of the construction analysis, the EIS also studied potential hazardous materials and air quality impacts. And while there were no significant impacts anticipated in these areas, the trust committed to a number of measures that would minimize or, or eliminate the potential for impacts. Um, so and as landlord, I'll note that the trust is able, will be able to require that any of the designated developers implement these measures through, through their development agreements or leases. Um, and these, these include uh, measures such as compliance with the remedial action plan that was developed in, in 2012, along with the construction health and safety plan to avoid any impacts from hazardous materials. Uh, the trust also committed to a, a employ additional measures, which would minimize air quality pollutants. Um, these include dust suppression me measures, uh, restrictions on vehicle idling, use of ultra-low uh, sulfur diesel, and the use of best available technologies during construction. Finally, I'll, I'll note that the trust is committed to undertake a public, and public engagement process throughout the course of construction that will assign personnel to coordinate with contractors and maintain up-to-date information on their website. There'll be a process whereby the trust will receive comments from the public if there are any effects being felt by park users. And then finally, there'll be flaggers uh, used th throughout the construction areas to make sure to ensure the safety of uh, park users throughout, throughout the course of the construction. Turning then to the shadows analysis. So although no specific building designs are being proposed at this time, the shadow studies uh, sought to, to assess the impacts, conservatively assess the impacts that would occur. So there was, the model looked at the maximum heights, that buildings up, potential buildings of the maximum heights that would be permitted in each parcel, and also conservatively modeled development that would have approximately 850,000 square feet more development than could actually be permitted under the rezoning. So that basically they've modeled a build out that is 20% larger than what would be permitted under the rezoning to make sure we're, we're capturing a really conservative estimate of what the shadows could be like. Um, the model looks at certain representative dates, uh, particularly the, the summer and winter solstices and the spring and fall equinox. Uh, and based on this, the lead agency and various involved agencies reviewed to see whether the shadows would significantly impact the use and enjoyment of the park by users or significantly impact plantings. So we'll take a closer look at the model. So this is of the results of the analysis for the, uh, of the potential shadows that would result from on the spring and fall equinox. Um, what you'll notice here, these are large development parcels. So most of the, of the new shadows would actually fall within the development parcels. Um, the incremental shadows that would land within the park are, or, and rather outside of the uh, development parcels are shown in red at various times throughout the day here. Um, this slide shows a, po a point in time midway between the spring and fall equinox and the summer solstice. 
And you can see here shadows are becoming more modest. And then looking at the summer solstice, this is really the peak of our, our public access season. Uh, and as you would expect at summer solstice, the sun is the highest in the sky, so the shadows become the smallest at this point. The other extreme, of course, is the winter solstice. This is when the shadows are the longest um, with, with the greatest extents in the morning. Uh, but on the other hand, this is outside of the, of the growing season and outside of the peak season for public use of the park. Um, so as far as, well, just to conclude on the shadows, um, so based on these studies, the reviewing agencies determined that the rezoning would not re result in significant shadow impacts. Um, and overall, the EIS disclosed that the rezoning would only result in potentially significant impacts with respect to transportation and construction transportation. So as far as next steps, the public can provide comments on the, D the draft EIS at or within 10 days of the City Planning Commission hearing. It has not been scheduled yet, but it's anticipated for February 2021. And um, the, based on public comments, uh, the, EI, the draft EIS will be put into final form. All comments received will be responded to in the final EIS, and it will be published at least 10 days before the City Planning Commission votes on the rezoning. That's anticipated for 2021. Um, so with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Wesley. I guess you're pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, yeah. you know, it's funny, you put up a slide that actually was helpful to me about, I just, just a little question, if I may ask, you had the summary of the analysis, which was really helpful. I just was curious, you do indicate on that summary, a distinction between the water and sewer infrastructure and the um, solid waste and sanitation that I was referring yeah. to in the last proposal. Is there something I'm missing here? I just want to understand that, if you don't mind. I, and I, I may have misunderstood your question, and I think Char Charlie was, was clarifying. So solid waste in term, and, and sorry, to, if I'm really jumping back. So no, it's just, it's just that it didn't exist on the 250 proposal, and it does yeah. here on Governor's Island as something that would be looked at as an imp in terms of impact. And I'm just curious why one has it and one doesn't. And I don't want us all to spend the time on it because we're not going to go backwards. But if you can address it, that would be handy. So the, the solid waste piece is really in terms of the DSNY pickups and carries to and from the island. And the DEIS looked at that in terms of um, the amount of additional trips DSNY would have to take. And that's really to serve uh, particularly the university element, whereas the commercial components of the development would be served by pri private carriers. So that, that is looked at here. There's a threshold for analysis that's used in Seeker, and this project is significantly larger and triggered the threshold for uh, the solid waste assessment. But did not in 250 Water Street, is that correct? Correct, and I was okay, mistakenly, I was... Refer your, your question was in part about the sewer infrastructure, and that's what I was referring to in, uh, on page 16. Yeah, it's actually sentence. So. Okay, thank you. So let's open it up um, to the, Community board uh, committee members and then the community board generally. Um, anybody have a question? Uh, Wendy Chapman. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, the The shadow study went so quick. I'd love to maybe get that slide later on, but we'll we'll take a look at that separately. But I appreciate it. But um, one of the things when I was reading through the documents today, and maybe I, I read it wrong, is that they, uh, you know installed a 12-inch uh, a uh, water pipe to the uh, island so that we can have fresh water out there when we're drinking it. And it's wonderful. And I remember going out to the island before there was water. Uh, one of the things that I read that, again, this is, I might have misinterpreted this. Water and sewer to if a new Why isn't that considered, you know, part of the things you want to discuss here, or am I, or am I reading it entirely wrong? I, I'm sorry, you're you're, you're on mute. You, all right, we can't hear you. Yeah, and I, and I apologize. Can you hear? I, I could not hear a, a portion of what you were saying, but um, 
you are, if I understood correctly, you, you were asking about the water service to the island. Um, there, there was additional water service installed before, and the, the EIS notes that in order to do the full build out, an additional water main would have to be installed. So that, that you're right. correct. Right. Is that a, is that a minor impact? No, that, that, that is not, not an impact. That is a, a, a part of the project that would be necessary and undertaken orders to serve the users. Okay. So in, in, in absence, uh, the, the project wouldn't function without, you know, at, at full build out, it would not function without the additional water service. Sorry. Um, okay. Anybody else? Um, Diana, do you see anybody else from? I don't see any other board members. I have uh, one attendee for the hand up. Okay. Well, I was gonna say, I have a, another question because, you know, the, the sewer and water would then go through Red Hook and, you know, go out that direction. Um, you know, isn't this a large enough project that it, that it might make a big impact? Uh, Maybe not. Um, uh, Wendy, Wesley, just feel free to jump in if I get this wrong, but um, because the water line isn't needed today and we don't have specific construction plans for that, um, we'll, any future, the construction of a second water main under the buttermilk channel would require additional approvals from DEC and the Army Corps um, and a whole alphabet soup of different entities. Um, but in terms of construction impacts wouldn't impact this EIS analysis. I think that's what you're driving at. And, and, and then I think another portion of your question was sanitary sewage coming from the island and if that had to be analyzed within the DEIS, the answer is yes. Sanitary sewage flows from the island. Uh, do go to the Red Hook uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility. That was analyzed within the EIS and the Increased volume was not a, is not enough to cause a significant impact on that facility. Okay, Wendy, you good? Thank you. Um, okay, I, I don't know who the caller is, but um, Diana, if you want to, I think it is Roger Manning. Roger, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm using the phone for audio. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, Roger Manning here um, from MAGIC, you know, the Metro Area Governors Island Coalition, the rather new group that, um, that supports the Seaport Coalition's uh, resistance against their rezoning and, of course, um, objects to the rezoning being proposed for Governors Island. Um, uh, this those are the details that's being heaped on us. Uh, you know, with regard to the Trust for Governors Island proposal and the draft empire, um, environmental impact statement diverts, actually obscures the key issue, which is what is Governors Island going to be? Is it going to be an irreplaceable, one-of-a-kind public space that essentially functions as a park, even in the areas with buildings, or another built over privately occupied urban district with, with a value-added uh, landscaping? Uh, the draft environmental impact statement essentially serves as a sales pitch for the trust um, development ambitions. It dismisses key concerns and any alternative development approaches and glosses over the impact of the heavy construction that's going to take place and tries to head off uh, a couple of key concerns like uh, uh, that of, particularly of open space, uh, with a very liberal and completely inadequate definition of open space, and claiming that Governor's Island is more than a park. And regarding shadows, um, winter is when sunlight is needed most, really. So, shadows in winter, that's definitely an issue. Um, I, yeah, I've gone over this, the, the, um, the draft environmental impact statement quite a bit. And I guess I've said what I need to say. Anyhow, thanks to um, Community Board One for all your work and and the trust. I know you you know, I know you're trying to 
make things work for Governor's Island. But um, in fact, the magic hopes to get in touch with you directly soon and maybe have some conversations about that. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, is that it? That's a really <laughs> an unexpectedly short meeting on a really big island. Um, oh, I got another hand up, which is Amy K. Okay, Amy. Amy, are you there? I'm here, thank you. Um, I just want to say again about the shadow study. And Claire, thank you so much. Wesley, everyone who's presented from Governor's Island. Um, I'm a parent from the Harbor School, so I, I know they're aware of these issues. And in other committee meetings, they have been incredibly diligent. The Trust for Governor's Island has done presentations and addressed all of our issues and concerns, and that's wonderful. But just to this committee, I want to say that the shadow study went very by very quickly, and the winter shadows especially um, directly impact the current Harbor School location and those buildings, which have been there you know, through winter, all these for a very, very long time. So that will have a direct impact, I would think, on those buildings and the infrastructure and, and the students. So um, I know Claire is aware of this, so I give her full credit and all of her team because I know they're addressing this. But to this committee, I just want to make sure that I agree the harbor, the, the shadows went by very quickly and need to be addressed. But thank you all very much. And we appreciate all the support from Governor's Island, certainly on everything the Harbor School does and has accomplished. Um, yeah. thank, thanks very much, uh, Amy. Okay, we have um, Gerald Forsberg, I see up here. Yes, hi, I just had one question um, regarding the shadow studies. Uh, am I correct in understanding that these, uh, the current studies were done using uh, the lower heights that have been proposed and have not been updated to include the additional height available uh, through the upcoming rezoning for resiliency? Yeah, the, 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 sh the shadow studies are based on the maximum height that is proposed uh, under the environmental review. It, it does not account for additional height that the Zoning for Coastal Resiliency project is under is, has, um, but we are looking at and, and appreciate any comments about the intersection of the project. I'd also know, Wesley, one of the important points you made at the beginning is, is that to be extra conservative on the shadow analysis, we actually assume that the, the overall bulk is 20% more than what we're even asking for in the proposal. So we added extra height onto the buildings to be extra conservative um, by about 20% of the total bulk. So no, it didn't, you know, take the 10 feet or whatever it is that you could do exactly, but I think in, in, implicitly in what we've analyzed, it, it would capture more than capture that amount of height for resiliency. Thanks, Chris. The only, Thank other, thing I would, the only other thing I would add to that is um, obviously we're working through all of the community board's comments, but one of the things we did address um, firmly in our December letter is that we are have are working with and will continue to work with DCP to close any um, uh, to close any loops on the way ZCFR, excuse me if I got the acronym wrong, which I'm sure I just did, interacts with height because we completely appreciate that as a concern and it is not the intent to have that add extra. Um, so that is already a firm commitment we've made and we, we continue to stand by that in, in addition to looking at the other comments, of course, from the community board. Thank you. One other question I have too is how how is how are these developments going to impact the um, wildlife on the island? It's it's my understanding that there's a substantial amount of geese that stop in the island, um, and I don't know if you're still using dogs to chase them off the island or not. But um, how has that been looked into? Um, Chris or Wesley? The the, the natural resources chapter. Um, uh, did look at impacts on wildlife and um, it did show no impacts. Um, we're definitely, um, uh, you know, very um, big fans of um, the migratory bird population that has made Governor's Island home today. And we work with the Audubon Society of New York and want to keep migratory birds coming to the island and happy. Um, but from a seeker perspective, um, 
the um, project would have no impacts. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that has a question? This is Rosa. Hi. Um, I Hi. just had a quick clarification. I was wondering if in the shadow studies that also uh, included the permitted obstructions or was that just the building? It, it does, it does yeah. include the permitted obstructions. Okay, excellent, thank you. And just so folks know, I do, um, the shadow slides I believe are also on our website on the because we posted copies of all the presentations we've given to the community board. Um, so we'll share the link again to this group. But if folks wanted to, you know, we didn't mean for it to go so fast. Um, those are public information online. Um, um, and again, what we shared tonight is consistent with, of course, the DEIS, but also that November 9th presentation. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add and th those materials come directly from chapter six of the DEIS, so that they, they're also available that means um thank you terrific uh are there any other questions or comments from the members of the public or community board i just see wendy's hand up but i don't know if that's uh wendy do you have a new question or comment i did i just um you know in terms of the transportation or the traffic study and you know i appreciate that that it is impacting um, and I, I think back to the Harbor School that those kids are there, uh, you know, going to school all year round. Uh, as far as I know, they walk from the um, ferry station to their school. Um, is the plan to ask people that are going to work or in a university setting or whatever's coming? Is that also going to be that everyone, you know, that uh, uh, you know, and, and just is there a transportation plan? Is there, you know, going to be electric vehicles or there? I mean, I know that's the future. You don't know it. It's it's up in the air, a little off topic, but it just made me think about that. The Harbor School, really, those kids are walking everywhere. Uh, and I'm sure when you go out there, you guys walk or take city bikes um, or the golf carts, you know, different places. But is that uh transportation impact on the Manhattan side? Is it a real commitment to keep the cars off the island? Yeah, so um, the transportation impacts on the Manhattan side are, you know, as, as you'd expect, sort of generated by trips, um, but really related to drop off or to parking garage, because there's no intent to allow uh, vehicles on the island beyond what is there today, which is really for emergency service. And then, um, vehicles needed to care for the park itself. Um, so those impacts are not, there's no impact on the island proper because there's no, um, yeah, no, no, no change in policy vis-a-vis -vis cars on the island. Okay. Okay. All right. I think that's, those that's are. I see. Okay, um, great. So I think, you know, we've, um, this obviously is the beginning. I think everybody was a little overwhelmed with a lot of applications being thrown at them at once. So I'm really delighted that we do have a little more time and thanks for sharing the schedule, Wesley. That's really helpful. We do have time and we will need it. Um, there certainly have been a lot of comments that have been provided um, uh, over the last few weeks that are sort of overlapping with some of what I think was stated in the resolution and some things that go specifically to this EIS. And I suspect there'll be many more, which we will, um, provide as we said in a letter that will go to you all i assume uh sooner than later as uh, so uh I, this is clearly not a comprehensive review of that plan i guess that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> it's probably apparent and we will do more, more homework on it and i'm i know you're always open to questions um i'm in my position here as as if you know in between being on a, a representative for both boards um you know certainly not going to opine too much here but uh I really want to simply say a huge thank you to you all for really um, at this point, really engaging wholeheartedly. And um, I think that we all can actually go back and watch our TV sets <laughs> um, to see what other great, great things are happening in the world. But I just, I want to thank everybody. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Diana, we could say good night. Is that right? 
I would second adjourning. <laughs> okay. All right, Let us very quickly thank you as well. Thank you, Alice, and the whole committee and the whole board. We appreciate it as always. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye, thank everybody. Bye. Thank you.